Contented Media presents Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. An original podcast series with Mark Hunter and Arthur Van Pelt. Craig Wright is an Australian computer scientist at the heart of a multi-billion dollar battle to see who owns Bitcoin. Not the cryptocurrency, the brand. Wright has been trying to get himself recognised as Bitcoin's pseudonymous creator Satoshi Nakamoto for over seven years, but having failed in the court of public opinion, he has recently taken his battle to bricks and mortar courts as he attempts to sue his way to being awarded ownership of the Bitcoin name and the trillion dollar ecosystem that comes with it. Wright's supporters claim he is undoubtedly the creator of Bitcoin, while his detractors believe his claim to the Bitcoin throne to be based on nothing but a phalanx of lies and forgeries, supported and funded by a billionaire casino magnate. Throughout this series, myself and my co-host, semi-professional Craig Wright debunker Arthur Van Pelt, will take you through the incredible story of Craig Stephen Wright and his attempts to claim ownership of the financial revolution that is Bitcoin. This is not a story about Bitcoin, blockchain or cryptocurrencies. This is a story of David versus Goliath, of the extraordinary lengths that Craig Wright is going to to try and seize ownership of the Bitcoin brand and the damage that is being done to regular people along the way. This is episode two, Who Let the Docs Out? Hello and welcome to Dr. Bitcoin, the man who wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto, the podcast that does indeed lift the lid on the efforts of Mr. Craig Stephen Wright to gain acceptance as Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. My name is Mark Hunter, author, blockchain writer and podcast host, and it is my job to guide you through the morass of events, claims, counterclaims, lies, thefts and lawsuits that all go into making up this at times unbelievable story. In episode one, we learned about how in 2014, the subject of our podcast, Craig Wright, began sowing the seeds of his claim to be Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. The rationale behind these claims seems to be Wright's need to explain how he was able to afford a series of multi-million dollar Bitcoin purchases through his companies that he tried and failed to claim back as tax refunds. We also learnt how, shortly after the death of his former business partner Dave Kleiman in 2013, Wright sued a research company set up by Kleiman, in which Wright worked, in 2011 for $57 million based on repayment of seemingly bogus Bitcoin loans. Wright appointed himself both plaintiff and defendant in the case, and settled for some spurious intellectual property instead. This intellectual property, which was in lieu of the $57 million as per Wright's request, Wright also attempted to use in his tax rebate scam. However, the Australian tax office didn't like what Wright was trying to do and audited several of his firms to death over his Bitcoin and IP dealings, highlighting numerous cases of fraudulent and other morally questionable behaviour along the way. The ATO, following forensic investigations and lengthy interviews with Wright, stated their belief that Wright was not Satoshi Nakamoto, but had instead assumed his identity in order to back up and distract from his fraudulent tax rebate claims. Arthur, there was a lot to unpack in episode one, but that's nothing compared to what's to come up, is it? No, let's kick it off then. So we left Wright in mid-2014 with the tax office breathing down his neck over what they said were fraudulent attempts to claim tens of millions of dollars in tax rebates for his companies. We also left him starting to spread the claim that he invented Bitcoin to the wider world, most notably the father of his former business partner Dave Kleiman, a decision that, as we will see, comes back to haunt him in many ways. We're going to jump forward 18 months to December the 8th, 2015, where Craig Wright is tucking himself into bed in a plush Sydney apartment, completely unaware that his life is about to change forever. Arthur, what does he discover when he wakes up? Yeah, then he finds out that they have published uh, two articles about him, that it appears as if uh, they found information or have been sent information of somebody who is trying to dox him as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. 
So Wired's headline said, is Bitcoin's creator this unknown Australian genius? While Gizmodo said, this Australian says he and his dead friend invented Bitcoin. Neither headline references Craig Wright by name, which is not really surprising given that he's virtually anonymous to the wider world at this point. But the pieces themselves, they focus solely on him thanks to this cache of material that was sent to reporters and that formed the basis of their investigations. Now, these documents, in the words of Wired, they immediately led to several direct publicly visible connections between Nakamoto and Wright. Um, we won't describe everything that's included in the cache of material, but the most important documents and, and uh, information was this. There was links to blog posts from Wright where he discusses the concepts behind Bitcoin months before it was made public. There was PDFs of documents such as private emails, accounting forms and transcripts of meetings between Wright, his legal team and the Australian tax office in which Wright discusses Bitcoin, both before and after its 2008 white paper publication and its 2009 launch. And there's also a PDF of a document authored by Dave Kleiman that states that he will take control of a trust fund of 1.1 million Bitcoin from Wright, which is referred to as the Tulip Trust. Wired said that their cache of evidence came from Gwern Branwen, which is the pseudonym of an independent security researcher and dark web analyst who had himself been fed the information in mid-November by what he claimed to be an anonymous source close to Wright. Gizmodo writers Sam Biddle and Andy Cush noted that their cash came from a series of anonymous tip emails from someone who said they had hacked Wright, adding that they worked with him and knew him to be Satoshi Nakamoto. Now we'll go into lots more detail on the viability of, of these claims later on. Now, throughout the leaked and supposedly private exchanges sent to Wide and Gizmodo, Wright repeatedly refers to himself as Satoshi Nakamoto, including, as we saw in episode one, to Australian tax officials, but also to several attorneys and even a New South Wales senator. His admissions, in inverted commas, to being Nakamoto are almost always done with a sense of resignation where he's giving the suggestion he's being unwittingly outed, such as, I did my best to try and hide the fact I've been running Bitcoin since 2009 and I do not want to be your poster boy, I am not found and I do not want to be. So here we have this handy package of information and evidence, a strong evidence on the face of it, all pointing to Dr. Craig Stephen Wright as being the creator of Bitcoin. Now, Arthur, did Wide and Gizmodo take the bait? Yeah, in, in a way they did, of course. The, the initial publication was not overly critical, mildly critical. Uh, what they claimed at that moment was that they received that information uh, a few weeks earlier in, uh, in November. And they did some inquiry, including uh, trying to reach out to uh, to Craig Wright. Um, on the other hand, they took most of it uh, at face value. The, the articles generally are, I'd say non-committal is the way I would describe it. They don't confirm one way or the other uh, whether they believe Wright to be Nakamoto. But there are a couple of things that they do say which are telling. And there's one quote from Wired, which comes down towards the end of their long article. And they say... Despite the overwhelming collection of clues, none of it fully proves that Wright is Nakamoto. All of it could be an elaborate hoax, perhaps orchestrated by Wright himself. The unverified leaked documents could be faked in whole or in part. And most inexplicably of all, comparisons of different archived versions of three smoking gun posts from Wright's blog show that he did edit all three to insert evidence of his Bitcoin history. Now, Wide also found that a blog post from August 2008 that had previously had no mention of cryptocurrency had been altered sometime after June 2014 to slip in a couple of extra lines, such as, I have a cryptocurrency paper out soon, 20 years, triple entry bookkeeping, BDO was good for something. Yep. So, as you say, it didn't take them long to, to spot that something was amiss, did it? Yeah, and it's it's actually not not really that hard to figure it out if you check uh, websites as Archive uh, Today or uh, the Wayback Machine. You can quickly figure out when were changes made on on that blog because uh, there are snapshots, regular snapshots taken uh, by the web crawlers of, for example, the Wayback Machine, and then you can check when uh, this text has been changed, and then you can pinpoint the moment when the change has been made. Interesting. So one or two other bits of interesting uh, information regarding the data that was sent to, to Wired and to Gizmodo. 
There's a critical piece of evidence, which is a blog post referencing Bitcoin's beta launch, um, which was ostensibly posted in January 2009, right at the time of the launch, but then seems to have been deleted and then undeleted, or maybe even written for the first time, somewhere between October 2013 and June 2014. And the post also referenced Bitcoin's beta launch when in fact it was Bitcoin's alpha launch that was launching, something that you would have thought Satoshi would have known, wouldn't he? No, it's not. It's it, it's certainly not a mistake that the real Satoshi would have made. There's also, of course, a date uh, mismatch when Craig Wright uh, backdated that blog post and and, and uploaded it under this uh, backdated date. He uh, said on uh, January the 10th that tomorrow we're going to launch uh, and bring Bitcoin uh, live. But yeah, in fact, uh, Bitcoin was already live on January the 3rd. Then uh, the Genesis block was already uh, starting to be uh, formed, which was finalized on January the, the 9th. And on the 9th at the same date, or the 8th, I think even, the first uh, upload of uh, the downloadable uh, client was already done on SourceForge. So the January 10 and tomorrow we are going live uh, makes it January the 11th. That, that was an incorrect uh, date for going live. And indeed, he mentioned uh, Bitcoin beta. Now, uh, I can tell you, Bitcoin beta was not uh, even uh, mentioned in that uh, era. Only by uh, October the 29th on 2009, Satoshi uh, chose to, uh, to upgrade uh, the alpha release to beta release. So. Yeah, uh, Mr. Wright, in his uh, uh, expert uh, knowledge, uh, quote unquote, uh, was uh, several months off uh, with calling it uh, Bitcoin beta. Mm -hmm. Wired asked why these breadcrumbs, as they called them, had been dropped in the first place, suggesting the theory that Wright was trying to steal Nakamoto's glory or his money. And then they said that the hoax, if a hoax it is, would be practically as ambitious as Bitcoin itself. There is one key email in the, the trove as well that was supposedly sent from Craig Wright to Dave Kleiman on March the 12th, 2008, which is months before the Bitcoin white paper was, was produced. And it says, I need your help editing a paper I'm going to release later this year. I have been working on a new form of electronic money, bit cash, bitcoin. You are always there for me, Dave. I want you to be part of it all. I cannot release it as me, GMX, Vistamail and Tor. I need your help and I need a version of me to make this work that is better than me. So that's a very nice little um, multifaceted bit of evidence to sort of slip in there. But critically, this email seems to show Wright knowing very well what Bitcoin is and spelling it correctly seven months before the white paper came out and three years before he would confusingly try and enlist his blog followers and setting up this PayPal of gold we've talked about before. As another aspect of that, though, it was discovered in 2018 that the web domain the email was supposed to have come from was only registered by Wright on January 23rd, 2009, meaning that he was able to either send the email from a domain he wouldn't acquire for another 10 months, or the email was fraudulent and the creator didn't think anybody would check. Wright's argument against this is that it was due to the merging of mailboxes, which made it look like emails were being sent from a domain that wasn't yet live. Now, I don't know much about this sort of thing, but is that a feasible argument he's made there that merging mailboxes can affect dates by months? No, not at all. I will not bore you with uh, the technical details, but I can tell you this is uh, bogus information that Wright is uh, providing here. So as we can already see, just by looking at what's been provided already, there is one thread that runs through all the evidence that's been put forward, all the evidence that, that even Wired and Gizmodo were able to see straight away, uh, didn't, didn't kind of check out, and it's dodgy documentation, whether it's been forged or backdated or doctored in some way. This is the thread that runs all the way through, and it's run through in Craig Wright's life since that first court case back in 2004, when the, um, the judge accused him of providing fake uh, evidence to back up his claims and it seems that it keeps running all the way through to 2015 to this point. Now there's one other aspect of the information hall which is PGP keys. My knowledge on this is limited Arthur so could you for the sake of myself and our audience explain what PGP keys are and why they were important in this information hall that was acquired by Wired and Gizmodo? 
you embed an email and you send that email to the other person who owns the key to that email to open it up and is then able to read the email and the rest of the world cannot read that email. So that keeps the information in the email a bit yeah, kind of private. But on the other hand, uh, it also date stamps with that key. You can uh, see at the end of the email, there is a long, 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 long string with letters and, and numbers and, and nobody knows what it means unless you know where to look and unless how you know to uh, decrypt it a little, then you can find somewhere the date stamp of when that exact PGP key was entered and added uh, to that email. Craig has been using these PGP keys uh, to make it look like uh, as if an email was uh, signed with a PGP key in, in now yeah, let's say uh, 2008 or 9 or 10, but uh, more earlier than it actually was. Um, Vice magazine themselves, uh, when they got hold of the story from Wired and Gizmodo, they did their own investigation and they say it's trivially easy to backdate a PGP registration. All you need to do is change the date and time on your computer clock when you create the key and backdate it to that date. And then you have a PGP key going back to that date. They also say it's ridiculously easy to assign this fake PGP key to an email account you don't control, which is really handy when you're trying to pass yourself off as somebody you're not. Uh, he also used it on a, on a blog post, and, and that is also yeah, quite interesting. What appeared as a uh, PGP key of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, it was connected to an email address that had a big resemblance to a Satoshi Nakamoto email, but when we looked uh, further, it uh, already quickly appeared that the, uh, I don't know the technical term, PG NUP version or something, there was a version stamp, I think, uh, mentioned that was not in use uh, before 2012. Now, and if you find that code number on an on an, uh, blog post in 2008, yeah, then you already know this, this has been forged. So we have to assume then that the person who backdated the blog post to include the private keys Either they didn't know they wouldn't be accepted as proof or they, again, didn't think anyone would look too deeply into it, which seems to be, again, another theme that's, um, that's coming up. Overall, then, what we can say is, ironically, um, this trove of emails, transcripts and backdated blog posts and what have you that was supposed to bolster his claims, apparently, in fact, served only to undermine the intentions behind the supposed leak. The leaker imagined that what they were sending out would be the smoking gun that would incontrovertibly name Wright as the creator of Bitcoin, but instead it led to him being considered as a potential perpetrator of a massive fraud, which again was summed up by Wired, who said, Despite a massive trove of evidence, we still can't say with absolute certainty that the mystery is solved, but two possibilities outweigh all others. Either Wright invented Bitcoin, or he's a brilliant hoaxer who very badly wants us to believe he did. Which, I mean, bear in mind, this is still 2015. This is the first time he's come on the radar. Um, and there's still no real strong evidence at this point of who actually sent the information, apart from these mystical, magical figures in the background. They already are edging towards Wright being behind this, though, aren't they? Yeah, that is the most logical explanation. Let's turn our attention then to the source of the leak, which is really almost more important than the leak itself, which is something that Wright discussed in 2019. The argument is there are multiple different versions of web pages uh, that have existed. Yes, things have been turned off and whatever else. Uh, that doesn't mean they were backdated. That is because I didn't go out to Wired. Wired and Gizmodo were played by a Mr. Contrarian. Mr. Contrarian was sending documents that were stolen from my company. In the days when no one knew about Bitcoin, I had 45 staff in Australia working on Bitcoin projects, basically secretly under the radar. And I started talking to a number of people like Peter Todd and Greg Maxwell and Adam Back. And the next thing I know is uh, I've got machines being hacked. I've got uh, files being leaked, altered versions of records going out and around the world and people putting out documents saying they're from me. This is why court matters. 
if someone tells you, I've got an email from Craig Wright, and it didn't come from me, and they haven't proved how they've gotten it, they don't have an email from Craig Wright. If they've got an email they said came from me, they don't have an email from me. That's why you have rules of evidence. It's called hearsay. If someone hands you a document, a PDF, a printout of an email and says, this came from Craig Wright, why do you believe that? Yet that's what people are doing right now. Wright seems to be claiming there that employees of his stole this information in 2013, doctored it, held on to it for two years before they felt the time was right to leak it to Wired and Gizmodo, apparently thinking that the two publications wouldn't conduct any further investigations as to its provenance and its, ac its accuracy and just simply believe it out of hand. That's not how journalists work, is it? No, no, <laughs> not at all. They are trained to do the opposite, in fact. They're, they're trained to look for ways uh, for which the information can be disproved rather than finding out how to believe it. That's exactly what they did, and that's why they ended up not believing what was sent. So these thieves, these leakers that Wright's blaming, were either um, ignorant or complacent. Now, initially, he pinned the blame on a kind of disgruntled ex-employee stealing a hard drive, didn't he? Yeah. So... He suggests that this, this ex-employee who, if they were already an ex-employee by this point, would have had to gain illegal access to the office, they were able to access and steal a physical hard drive from the man who professed himself to be certifiably the world's foremost IT security expert. This person was also able to break down the layers of encryption he'd put on there and access all the data on the drive. They then set about backdating blog posts and doctoring and fabricating documents on the drive to support the suggestion that Wright was Satoshi Nakamoto, which is odd because if Wright was Satoshi Nakamoto, then they shouldn't have had to doctor anything. There should have been plenty of information on that drive that would have corroborated Wright's claims, shouldn't there? Yeah, yeah. He has been accusing a lot of people and, and organizations and uh, even the world famous Anonymous has been accused of uh, doing these things uh, since 2011. I remember he did a speech uh, on, a, on a conference and suddenly he started mentioning, uh, yeah, I wrote a few articles in 2011 about Anonymous. Uh, and uh, since then I've been hacked continuously, uh, etc. Like I said, there is more than a handful of people have been mentioned by, by Mr. Wright. Well, none of these people have been um, inquired properly. Uh, none went to court for it, none went to jail for uh, hacking uh, him. And it, we're talking about millions and millions of uh, possible uh, uh, information that might uh, that people might be able to hack uh, from him because if he's Satoshi Nakamoto and we're talking about his mind uh, bitcoins there are private keys uh, to find with him well that would be more way more interesting material to hack from uh, Mr. Wright but instead it's all altered material of a very different type and always when you look at the situation when it pops up, it's first beneficial to Mr. Wright, it gets called out, and then suddenly the hack excuses uh, start uh, popping up. So when it comes to the backdating of these blog posts, let's be generous then and say that the first blog he backdated was early 2014. If that was the case, this IT security magician who's worked for various governments doesn't realise his blog has been hacked and amended since January 2014. He's on it all the time. There's no way he can't notice that his posts are being backdated and, and changed and reposted, especially after a hard drive has been stolen. Um, that, you know, there is no way he doesn't notice that. Yeah. And then there's another thing, which is the, the kind of practical side. I'm, I'm assuming if you or I came into work and we realised a hard drive containing sensitive personal information had been stolen, especially information that could damage us if it got out to the public sphere, we would, at the very least, take steps to protect that information. We'd report it to the police, we would try and, you know, at the very least, we would change passwords. Wright doesn't even seem to change the password on his blog. He leaves that password completely untouched or doesn't record the fact that someone has hacked in and changed it. 
And the fact that this leaker was supposedly able to work on tampering with his past for two years after the hard drive was stolen is, is pretty hard to stomach. Um, even if he didn't call himself the world's foremost IT security expert. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's laughable. Yeah, and, 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 and also knowing that it's it's not only the, the blog that has, that has been uh, uh, forged. If you know, uh, especially from the climate case, uh, we know so many types of forgeries. It's unbelievable, especially when you look at all the correspondence with uh, Dave Kleiman that has been backdated to make it look like as if he was in touch with Dave Kleiman a lot in, in 2008 until he died, actually, in, in, in April 2013. Mm -hmm. Well, let's still work on the assumption that we don't yet know who did the leaking. Let's just pretend for a second that we're still open to persuasion on, on either side. One of the many journalists who received all this information said that he quit. Um, he doesn't say which company it was, but he says he quit one of Wright's companies because Wright would make them, quote, work like dogs. So that obviously is trying to give the impression that there's some kind of revenge leak in some way. Now, this theory, though, throws up more questions than it answers, the main one being the method, because someone that's bent on revenge and who has access to these personal documents, email accounts, access to a blog, all this sort of thing, for someone that they despise and doesn't use that access, knowing it could be cut off at any time, um, you know, the hard drive could be recovered in some way or it could be, you know, wiped or whatever it might be. They use this to doctor documents, emails and blog posts over a period of two years, which they then send to journalists in the hope of them writing a story about this person having an alter ego. I mean, there are so much darker and more devious ways that that hard drive access can be put to use if you've got a mind to do so. I mean, as punishments go, it's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, knowing that in those years between 2013 and 2015, he was uh, under a uh, very strict inquiry of uh, refund integrity, eh? the, the ATO department that was onto the tax refunds that he was claiming. Tens of millions he was claiming in those years to, to, to try uh, defraud uh, the ATO. So if you want to frame Mr. Wright in, in a sense that somebody is doing a revenge, you try to grab the information that is proving that he is a fraud and you would send that to the ATO or to the police or, or you do that type of thing to, to frame him and to nail him and to bring him in, in, into a negative spotlight. Mm -hmm. And as well, it's the fact that they do it using really badly doctored evidence. I mean, this, this is the suggestion that Again, there was nothing on this hard drive that could legitimately link Wright to being Satoshi Nakamoto. And if they've stolen one hard drive, then they are going to, you assume that they know what might be on there. They've got a pretty good idea of what might be on there, but no, they steal it. Nothing on there that links him to being Satoshi Nakamoto, even though he says he is. So they are left with no choice but to fake all this stuff, which is so badly done, it's never going to be proven to be correct. So the whole thing is already a house of cards. But... When I went down this rabbit hole, it was fascinating because you can just keep going on forever. Because like I said, every answer that Wright gives, every suggestion he puts forward, it just throws up thousands more questions, which is why I really love going down these rabbit holes. But in claiming that someone doctored the information, uh, which Wright is agreeing with in 2019, he is saying that the evidence linking him to being Satoshi Nakamoto can't be trusted. However, when he said that in 2019, this is after he's told the Australian tax office and Louis Kleiman um, that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. So his argument seems to be that the ex-employee knew he was Satoshi and used doctored information to out him, unaware that by using faked evidence, he was actually doing his claim more harm than good. The whole thing is so perverse, isn't it? If you reason logically about this uh, situation, it only makes sense that Mr. Wright himself, uh, he, he doxed himself with this material. And looking at the timeline of, of events happening between uh, the Amazon uh, post that he made, being frustrated up till uh, how Wired and Gizmodo came out, that whole timeline of events, it only makes sense knowing that in the background there was this tax uh, inquiry going on and uh, it ended up in a raid and he needed to 
have a positive spotlight he needed to have proof against the ato look i am really satoshi nakamoto i do have these millions don't worry about it it only makes sense that he did it himself and there's one more aspect to this which i love is that his argument is that documents attributed to him can't be trusted even though they have his name on them and yet, how many documents has he put forward to the Australian tax office with his name on them, claiming them to be legitimate, but they're not? It's just, it's poetry, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. And and that reminds me of, uh, of a uh, deposition in the climate case where he admitted at some point, I think everything has been altered. <laughs> I found that so beautiful that he said it himself. Yeah. And that means that you can never trust me. You can never trust my material because yeah. everything, he literally said it, everything has been, I believe everything has been altered. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Beautiful. Man. You couldn't sum it up yeah, any better, beautiful. could you? So if we've got our little whiteboard with our, our suspects on it, I think by now, we can throw out this idea of a disgruntled employee because however you slice that, you can't say an ex-employee stole the hard drive and did this. It's just totally implausible. So we have to then look at anyone else who could be in the frame. Now, Wright helped us a bit here in September this year when he seems to change tack completely on on his years, his like six year long conviction that it was an ex-employee stole his hard drive, etc., etc. When he said that it wasn't actually an ex-employee that did it at all. In a message to his private community channel, he asked the question, why has no one worked out who really was the one who benefited most by the wide Gizmodo outing or doxing? He then answered his own question, turning the tables on his six-year theory in the process. According to him, the leaker had confidential information and wanted more, talked to Bitcoin core members to aid his scam with their complicity, was someone who started planning a lawsuit in 2014 as he was not happy with tens of millions, nor having to wait to cash in shares, and someone who is happy to fabricate stories and paint me negatively in the media. This person also had all the material in the form where I'd received it and knew I had several degrees and doctorates, but worked with others, knowing that I was going to hide it in the media hit as I unfortunately did. Do you remember, I'm sure you do, who he then pointed the finger at? Yeah, yeah. The guy who started the lawsuit in 2018, Mr. Ara Kleiman. Yeah, it's crazy. Exactly. He called him a web manipulator and affiliate marketing expert, the one who seeds search engines with fake news for a career. Not even going to begin to go into what that uh, is all about, because this is not what this podcast is all about. But again, he, he does love to throw accusations. So for a bit of background, Ira Kleiman is the brother of Wright's former business partner, Dave Kleiman, who we covered in depth uh, the last episode. He it was who looked further into Wright following the email Wright sent to their father, Louis Kleiman, in mid-2014, telling him the pair of them invented Bitcoin. The key thing to note here is that Wright either no longer thinks an ex-employee stole his hard drive, but instead thinks that Ira Kleiman was behind the leak. Now, on the surface, this could be seen as simply petty vindictiveness. But again, as we did with the previous theory, it's worth having a look at this allegation to see if it sticks. Now... Firstly, Wright is either completely discounting the claims he'd held until that point about the disgruntled ex-employee, or he's saying that Ira Kleiman pretended to be the ex-employee when he did the doxing. As a theory, it's feasible in that Ira could have pretended to be a disgruntled ex-employee in a few emails. So as far as that goes, you know, it's not impossible. But the next step then is to ask how he got the information. Now, Presumably, Wright found a hard drive missing from his computer, otherwise how could he say with any certainty it was a stolen hard drive that was the cause? Yep. So he's either lying about the hard drive being stolen, or it actually was, either by Ira Kleiman himself, or someone he maybe paid to carry it out. Now, seeing as Kleiman lived in America, it's pretty unlikely he flew over to Australia for a few days to carry out the job, regardless of his ability to successfully do so. It seems then that Wright is suggesting Kleiman hired someone or some kind of gang to break into his office and steal the hard drive and then decrypt it, hoping he wouldn't notice it was gone in time for them to doctor the documents. Yeah, 
if you think it makes sense. <laughs> Not in the slightest, if I'm honest with you. The only other way Ira could have got hold of the information and pushed it to Nathaniel Popper, Leah Goodman and the rest of them is if we follow Wright's other theory that he was hacked by a bunch of Bitcoiners in 2013, who then, two years later, passed all the information, faked and otherwise, onto Ira. Now this would fit with Wright's conspiracy theory that there's some cartel of Bitcoiners that's been out to get him for over seven years, with his argument potentially being that they wanted to stitch him up with this faked evidence, or out him as Satoshi, depending if we're living in a world where they believe him or not. Now that whole theory falls down, however, when you find out that Ira Kleiman wasn't even in the picture until April 2014, by which time several blog posts had already been backdated and other material doctored, and it wouldn't be until months later that this Bitcoin cartel would have got wind of any issue between Wright and the Kleiman estate that could, in Wright's mind at least, have fitted with their narrative to bring him down in some way. Yeah. Given that Ira Kleiman is trying to get back half of the, the Bitcoin property and the IP um, that Craig Wright says he and says and then denies that he and Dave mined and created together. What this theory suggests then is that after stealing this hard drive, either Kleiman stealing it himself or getting a gang to do it, they use this highly personal and sensitive information they find on there or fraudulently create on the on the back of it, not to blackmail him into handing over the Bitcoin or the IP, not to prove he wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto, but to backdate blog posts and doctor other documents to make it look like he was Satoshi and feed journalists. Which, again, it just doesn't make any sense. There's no logic to it at all. And what wasn't included in the evidence pack sent to the, sent to the outlet was the genuine email that Wright sent to Louis Kleiman in 2014 saying that he and Dave and the third party created Bitcoin. So why go to all the trouble of backdating these blog posts and committing all these other forgeries that could be easily disproven only to leave out the legitimate email that could act as massive proof? That is a, is a huge red flag, another red flag for me with the idea that Ira did all this. Yeah. That, that might be the suggestion, but the, the, the suggestion for the, the, the disgruntled uh, ex-staff member that might have been um, something that happened in, in 2013, but Ira would of course not be able to steal something in 2013 because he didn't know about Craig, so yeah, then Craig will of course change his story. The other thing as well is that for someone that has believed a certain story for six and a, six and a bit years, they've stuck to this story for six and a bit years, to then suddenly change tack at just happens to be the same time this person is suing you, completely, you know, coincidental. You you change your tack, you change your story to say that they did this. You've got to have some pretty strong proof um, to undo your theory of six and a half years. So what proof did he offer that pinpointed Ira Kleiman as this new thief? And none. Just a story. No. <laughs> Absolutely none, which is fantastic in itself. And there's a quote from the judge in the Kleiman Wright case, which speaks to this. It says, when confronted with evidence indicating that certain documents had been fabricated or altered, he, Wright, became extremely defensive, tried to sidestep questioning, and ultimately made vague comments about his systems being hacked and others having access to his computers. None of these excuses were corroborated by other evidence. So there, I think you've pretty much can now completely put to bed this theory that a disgruntled ex-employee was behind it, that Ira Kleiman was behind it. You can discount those two, which leaves us with only one person who could possibly have orchestrated this entire thing, and that's Craig Wright himself. So using the means motive opportunity scale let's go through it to see if right fits the bill so how would right i'll ask you these questions then how would right have benefited from being doxxed as satoshi nakamoto now yeah when you talk about uh, 2015 late 2015 he, he was very eager and, and very desperate to be recognized as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto because it would support his case against uh, the ato so He's got a motive. I'd say he's got the strongest motive of the three candidates we've got so far. Does he have the means to backdate and doctor these documents and leak them to the press? 
I would be a total liar if I would answer that with no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has got easy and instant access to his own emails, documents and blog logins. He wouldn't need to steal anything or bypass any security measures. He knew how to send emails that could be cryptographically disguised so their location couldn't be identified to make it seem to come from different people. So, yeah, we can safely say he's got the means. So he's got the means, he's got the motive. We don't even need to really ask the question about the opportunity because if it's your hard drive and your computer, then yes, you have the opportunity to amend all these things whenever you like. You can do it one o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the afternoon. You can do it whenever you like. So I don't even think we need to bother Sherlock Holmes for this. He can stay in bed with his pipe. I think Dr. Watson is capable of solving this one, isn't he? I think <laughs> it's it's pretty obvious that the two culprits that Wright has pointed out the tangled web that's necessary to be woven to finger them as, as the guys that did this is so long-winded and so ridiculous it's not even feasible but then you compare that with just how easy it is for him to do and it's it's an open and shut case as far as that goes you don't need any bias you don't need any preconceived ideas you just need to look at the evidence and the likelihood to be pretty sure of what took place there so Taking a step back then from the, the details of this hack, the why, the where and the how, let's look at some background information that helps build the picture out a bit more. It turns out, as you said earlier, that Wide and Gizmodo were far from the only outlets that received this dossier. Um, as you say, Nathaniel Popper, the New York Times reporter and author of Digital Gold, a book on Bitcoin, which was published in May 2015, tweeted after publication that he had been sent a very curious email attempting to dox Craig Wright in the October of 2015, but he ignored it because he didn't find it convincing at the time. Leah McGrath Goodman, who was the reporter who misidentified uh, Dorian Nakamoto as being Satoshi in 2014, she replied to that tweet to say, we all got it. It was being shopped around fairly aggressively this autumn. Yeah. And it was Goodman's tweet that featured the email itself from the supposed ex-employee who said that Wright had fined them because they refused to work like dogs. Now, again, going back to Wright's theory of the ex-employee, what's interesting to note here is that Wired and Gizmodo made no reference to an ex-employee being the leaker with Wired writing that their source described themselves as someone who worked with Wright but didn't state their motive. So to Wired, the leaker comes across as a former co-worker with no outward signs of malice towards Wright at all, but to other outlets he takes a different tone and says he's this embittered former employee. Do you think that speaks to this idea that Wright was trying to do it a bit softly to begin with, but no one no one took the bait, so he had to push it a bit further with the follow-up emails? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When he figured out that uh, when he did not get a reply uh, within hours or a few days from, uh, from the first, he tries the second. And when he is uh, noticing that uh, one or two t times uh, the same type of email is not working, he will try uh, the next uh, strategy. And, and that is the same type of thing that you see him using. That's where you uh, where you recognize uh, how a common works. They test the waters, what sticks they keep and what doesn't stick they throw away. There's a very, very important aspect to all this we haven't covered yet because of the timeline. But if winning over the tax office wasn't enough of an incentive for Wright to become recognized as Satoshi, what the world didn't know at the time of this leak was that Wright was actually contractually obliged to do so. Because in mid-2015, about four months before these journalists began receiving these dossiers from this so-called disgruntled ex-employee, Wright signed probably the most important deal of his life. One of his longtime friends, Stephen Matthews, who had fallen for the Satoshi story hook, line and sinker, had approached Robert McGregor, the founder and CEO of tech company Entrust, with the suggestion that they could market Wright as the creator of Bitcoin and use his reputation to sell the software that, that they thought would revolutionize the world of finance. Now, Matthews expected to make billions from Wright, mainly because of this Satoshi Nakamoto connection, uh, as well as Bitcoin's uh, decentralized technology. For Wright's part, he would get a role as chief scientist within Encrypt, a subsidiary of Entrust, and a lump sum up front if he agreed to sign over Bitcoin-related intellectual property, including what he acquired through suing his own companies in 2013. 
Wright would get to work with this same IP in a purpose-built development hub in London, spewing out these Bitcoin-based products and services and patterns like some sort of fireworks on the 4th of July. This is really important because McGregor would also pay to get Wright's mess of legal and financial entanglements squared away, including the sale or dissolution of the companies that were mired in debt. So the, what people didn't realise is that Wright was on a... Um, a egg timer like a sand timer to be revealed as satoshi wasn't he yeah yeah and and, and, I, and i even want to mention um, they were already preparing for the um, signing sessions of may 2016 and i can even see an, a motivation uh, popping up from there because the signing sessions that he agreed on uh, roughly in november december uh, because that is when when the the, the the preparation already started for the, the session in May 2016, is that of course he could not sign, he knew already. So again, pressure on Mr. Wright to be outed on a less conventional way how you would uh, like to see how Satoshi outs himself by signing the Genesis block or by um, posting on the P2P Foundation forum or on the Bitcoin forum or uh, sh uh, showing emails with uh, the original gangsters from 2008 and 9 that has never been revealed before and then get confirmation from these uh, OGs of the old days uh, yeah yeah that is indeed my email wow you have it you are Satoshi you know then you have proper proof but of course he knew that he could not sign he could not he will never be able to sign never and um when that pressure comes up in, in November, there is another reason for him to be outed as Satoshi, probably to, to avoid these signing sessions. Wright has stated many times he doesn't like the attention, or at least if it's negative towards him. So yeah, it's pretty clear that the prospect of being shoved in front of these TV cameras and, and being made to talk about Satoshi Nakamoto was probably enough to give him a stomach ulcer. He talked about this actually in 2019 when he told a judge that he, McGregor, wanted me to go to the media and stand and dance and be Satoshi, which I didn't want to do. So if you throw in the fact that he would, under pressure, as you say, also have to cryptographically prove he was Satoshi, re almost regardless of whether he could do it or not, you're painting this picture of an animal being backed further and further into a corner um, and at some point they're, they're going to act, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's what you think. On the other hand, I can also say that he likes to be in the spotlight and that is also um, part of, I think, his, his character. He, he wants attention, he wants to show himself. He is a bit of a narcissistic personality, I would say. One part of him says that he wants to be outed as a Satoshi, he wants to be known as Satoshi, he wants to have the fame and, uh, and, 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 and the richdom of, of Satoshi Nakamoto. On the other hand, he knows that he can never survive any scrutiny when he is trying to, uh, to be in the spotlight about it. And that means that he is also reluctant to get into that spotlight. Going back to the, the deal that he signed then with McGregor and Matthews, um, we get a sense of how tempting this offer must have been for him from Scottish author Andrew O'Hagan, who we referenced in the last episode, who spent about nine months with Craig Wright around this time. He says, the Wright's financial situation was dire. They couldn't pay their staff and a number had already left. Pedersen and some others had stayed on without pay. Wright owed his lawyers $1 million. Superannuation remittances were overdue and loan repayments unpaid. The companies needed £200,000 just to make it to next week. Craig and Ramona, his wife, had sold their cars. One of the companies was already in administration and, with the ATO closing in, all related entities were on the brink of collapse. So you've got this man who's heavily in debt, whose companies are collapsing around him, who's engaged in an attritional years long battle with the tax authorities. And he's been given the chance to wipe it all away and start again in his ideal job if he can prove he is Satoshi Nakamoto. And this is all signed six months before someone starts pushing the idea that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto to a bunch of media outlets using fake evidence. Now, we don't know if Wright played hardball or bit McGregor's hand off with the deal, but truthfully, he really had no option. 
even without this initial fee, which was one and a half million dollars up front, McGregor and Matthews would have been pretty um, convinced they would they would have got their their guy. So, I mean, at this point, we don't know if Craig Wright knows whether he genuinely believed he could convince the world he was Satoshi or he simply bluffed in order to get the money. But he knows he's got to prove it. So he's really painting himself into a really difficult position by accepting this deal, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. Now we know this, we're adding another layer to the suggestion that Wright would be the main beneficiary from the press outing him as Satoshi. Firstly, he's fulfilling his contractual obligation, and secondly, he's doing it on his own terms without having to go in front of a camera and be questioned about it by people that may know more about it than he does. So if the material at the heart of the leak had been kosher, he might have actually got away with this. He might have not had to parade himself as he did, but as it was, the slapdash way it was gone about meant that it didn't survive cursory investigation and the whole thing, as we now know, was revealed to be a whole mess of forgeries and backdated documents anyway, so it, whatever attempt was made completely fell apart. Looking at the motive alone for one minute, I know we, we seem to be going over old ground here, but it's worth kind of bedding these things in to really kind of paint the picture for the years to come. We've got four options on the table here. We've got the ex-employee, who we've already scrapped. We've got Ira Kleiman, who we've already scrapped. We've got Craig Wright, which is looking very, very feasible. The other option is that McGregor and Matthews were behind it because they wanted to get the press to do the work for them. Now, we know they were planning a big reveal up front. Maybe they weren't planning a cryptographic reveal from the very beginning. Do you think it's it's feasible that they were behind the manufacturing of the evidence to widen Gizmodo to have the job done for them nice and quickly? No. To me, that does not make very much sense, of course, because they were already planning at that moment the, the signing sessions of uh, May 2016, and that is the proper way. They wanted to do the proper way of uh, how you would expect uh, Satoshi Nakamoto to reveal himself, which is uh, using the private keys of the early stash uh, of, of him. So why would they overrule that good plan into a bad plan and sending forgeries around? Nay, it doesn't make sense to me, actually. It doesn't, and I think, I think we still have Craig Wright as the main, um, the main candidate for this particular crime, if you like. Being a very intelligent man, uh, with an IQ of 179 to 182, depending on what day of the week it is, Wright is almost certainly aware of the philosophical principle of Occam's razor which is often misinterpreted as the simplest answer is often the correct one. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. The actual kind of phraseology is, when presented with competing hypotheses about the same prediction, one should select the solution with the fewest assumptions. I think it's pretty clear which of these four hypotheses Mr. William of Ockham would have plumped for, isn't it? Yeah, if you, uh, yeah, there's no doubt in my head that the one on top uh, is uh, Mr. Craig Wright himself. And it didn't take long after the publication of these pieces on the 8th to the 9th of December for others to uh, come up with the same theory. New York Times journalist Kashmir Hill tweeted that having seen the reports and the Nathaniel Popper link that the mysterious person who hacked Craig Wright and gave his emails to reporters is Craig Wright. Do you remember... Um, if there were many other people that subscribed to this theory at the time? Because you said this is when you first came across him, really. So do you remember if this whole idea of him being behind it was popular on the day that the pieces came out? No. Uh, based on the articles that I have read back then, and, and later, of course, uh, I start repeatedly uh, going back to these articles, but there's only a few articles that are mentioning these options, and one is even based on the theory of, yeah, this must be Craig Wright, and uh, I will show you why. As I think, as you've alluded to already, as part of the investigations, both Wide and Gizmodo, of course, tried to speak to him. They both managed email and phone contact initially, but pretty early on, Wright soon avoided all contact with them around the time of publication, and certainly straight afterwards, he never he never spoke to them again, and he never confirmed or denied suggestions he was Satoshi. But as is often the way, um, actions speak louder than words, and 
on the day that the pieces came out, websites for two of Wright's companies at the centre of his tax investigation, De Morgan and Cloudcroft, were taken offline, as well as a YouTube video of Wright promoting a trading operation at Cloudcroft using one of the two supercomputers we mentioned last week that the Australian tax office said didn't exist. Uh, a letter of endorsement from SGI, who allegedly provided the supercomputers to Cloudcroft, confirming the sale of one of the supercomputers, which had been published on Cloudcroft's website, also went down with the ship. And the author of this fabricated letter was never identified. I can't imagine who that could have been. No, no. Total mystery. <laughs> <laughs> so, regardless of who it was that provided Gizmodo and Wide with the information on rights and supposed links to Satoshi Nakamoto, it's pretty clear that they at least hoped, but more likely believed, that it would be a slam dunk, that everyone would be singing Wright's names from the rooftops and thanking him for creating Bitcoin. As we know, this wasn't the case at all. But what the leaker couldn't have imagined was that both Wide and Gizmodo would not just be a bit unsure about the claims, they would row back on the certainty of their observations just days later, pretty much washing their hands of the entire thing. Gizmodo alerted their readers to the fact that Wright had scrubbed much of his digital presence and disappeared after the expose, leaving the readers to piece together what that might mean for Wright's claims to be Satoshi. Wired, though, went all out, publishing a new piece three days later, which identified new clues to suggest that their newly anointed king of Bitcoin might in fact be a hoaxer. They also felt compelled to add the words probably not to their initial headline of is Bitcoin's creator this unknown Australian genius. However, that wasn't the end of the backpedalling. In 2019, Wired added a disclaimer prologue for anyone arriving late to the article, which is still there. It states that in the days following publication of this story, Wired published an update that identified inconsistencies in the evidence supporting the notion that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. And the disclaimer ends by saying the headline has been changed to make clear that Wired no longer believes Wright is likely to be the creator of Bitcoin. They have pretty much rode back on what they put out a few days ago. So really, overall, what can we take from this December 2015 doxing that wasn't? Pretty much that it put Wright's name on the map as a potential scammer who, for reasons unknown at the time, was trying to fake his way to the title of Bitcoin's creator. We also know that all the evidence pushed to journalists to support the suggestion that Wright knew about Bitcoin prior to mid-2011 was either forged, fabricated or doctored in some way. The only genuine material comes in the form of government transcripts in which Wright makes claims about Bitcoin that are either backed up with his questionable evidence or not backed up at all. We can also surmise that the amount of effort that went into putting together a package of backdated blog posts, doctored documents and fabricated emails was only matched by the sloppiness of the work, suggesting someone that was either terrible at their job or in a big rush to get the information out. Now, we've already heard Wright discuss this evidence once before during a talk in 2019, but here's more of what he had to say about it. Here's the thing. Evidence. We have courts. You know what happens when you lie in a court? You know the maximum penalty in this country for perjury? It's about 20 years. Great! I'm going to be in court. Prove it in court. You get to send me to jail for 20 years. I get to put my evidence and other people get to put theirs. That's how real things work in the real world. The real world People have evidence and rules. People put documents out and get a chance to actually have them analyzed properly. People in the real world, outside Twitter, Facebook, and fake news, get to actually say, um, I'm sorry, I didn't create that. Just because someone wrote my name on a PDF didn't mean it came from me. I don't know about you, but I find that as important. I find this whole world of a thousand years of common law important. I will do it in court where I will be held liable for my actions. Thank you. Now, the reason why Wright is so impassioned here is because aspects of the doctored information sent to Wide and Gizmodo and used to out him are being used against him, as you say, in the case against the estate of Dave Kleiman. Now, 
if he genuinely didn't create these documents, it's understandable why he's so passionate about their existence and why he's so keen to prove their inauthenticity. However, as we'll see in a later episode, there is a wealth of evidence that suggests they were his doing, and he, in fact, nearly lands himself a night in the cells when he tries to debunk it. And again, it's worth reiterating here that Wright's story is that someone did this to him. Someone wanted to get revenge on him by manufacturing evidence to suggest he is Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, this is where we have those one of those contradictory things again. As it turns out, the evidence was fake. We can all go home. No story here, except perhaps Wright didn't try to find out who did it. The problem is that in the back of Wright's mind at the time in 2015 is the knowledge that at some point he's going to have to do just that to prove he is Satoshi. So he's stuck between a rock and a hard place here. He has to say the evidence is fake because no one's believing it, but he also knows he's going to have to come up with a better evidence to prove he is Satoshi in a few months' time. Uh, he's in, he's, uh, yeah, like you said, between a rock and a hard place. The only plausible explanation we've got from his point of view is that the the thief believed that Wright was Satoshi, knew about the Entrust deal and wanted to make him appear to be a fraud and possibly lose him the deal. But if this is the case, then they didn't need to bother stealing the hard drive if they're going to manufacture the evidence anyway. And if you think he's Satoshi, you would assume he's got mountains of other evidence on other hard drives to back up his claim so you wouldn't chance your arm with a bunch of bad fakes anyway. So yep. once again, we're back to Craig Wright being the main the main guy behind this. Yep. The last thing we'll say on the subject of the stolen hard drive is that, as far as I know anyway, Craig Wright has never shown any interest in catching the employee responsible for upending his life literally overnight. He's never mentioned going to the police about it or otherwise trying to identify the culprit, despite this being a serious infringement on his personal life and a far greater offence than those he frequently berates others for engaging in on a regular basis. This in itself is interesting because the list can immediately be narrowed down to ex-employees of his companies, a figure which can't be that high given the Australian tax office concluded that at least one of his companies he didn't employ any staff at all. Have you ever come across him trying to find the person that allegedly did this? Mm. No. <laughs> That's a really short uh, no. We're coming towards the end of this episode now. There's been a lot to take in, but there's one very important event that happened uh, just hours, really, after the, the, the doxing took place. Wright's home and businesses were raided by federal agents on behalf of the ATO. Um, they took computers, bank statements, mobile phone records, research papers and photographs, all taken away in relation to his businesses and his Bitcoin endeavours more specifically. However, you might remember at the start of the episode, we told you Wright was tucked up in bed in a luxury Sydney apartment. That wasn't his. The reason he was there is because him and his wife had gotten wind of what was going on through a journalist who approached the house the previous day. And afterwards, Wright removed several computers from his garage, relocated himself and his wife Ramona to this Meriton World Tower in Sydney on the advice of Stephen Matthews. Now, bear in mind that Wright has always maintained he is not on the run from the tax office, but when the police turned up at the Meriton, he fled the apartment, hid in a toilet cubicle with the police just feet away from him, and then ran down 60 flights of service stairs to get to the car park. He left the car park and drove around for a bit before heading to Sydney Airport, catching a flight to Auckland, then Manila via Hong Kong, trying to erase his social media presence during a layover in Hong Kong. This was the time when the Cloudcroft videos and the documents disappeared from the internet, as well as possibly his LinkedIn page and more. His wife, Ramona, who was also in the apartment with him and told him to get the hell out when a reception called to say the police were there, also made it down to the car park, crashing her rental car into the exit barrier before finally making her own way out of the complex. Wright met up with Matthews in Manila, where they went through the full effort of expunging his internet presence, and the following day, he was put on a flight to London, where he and Ramona had been planning to move to in a few weeks' time anyway, to start Wright's work for Entrust, where they finally did reunite the next day. Um, Arthur, how do you explain these actions from a man who claims he has nothing to hide? Yeah, again, makes no makes no sense. It, just look at the timeline of events, and you see the Wright and Gizmodo articles and the raid, and... It's the raid that caused him to flee. That's pretty obvious. 
I don't know what the order of events is. We know that a journalist approached him the previous day and he and he seemed to kind of get wind of what was not what was going to happen specifically, but what was in, in the wind, perhaps. I imagine he then phoned Stephen Matthews um, to tell him what could be happening. And Matthews then told him to get out. That seems to me the more likely timeline. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that, did that reporter talk to the AT ATO or did that reporter got hint, uh, hints from Bart and Gizmodo? It is more likely, I think, that this reporter has uh, did get some inside information from the ATO. Because why would you flee for Wired and Gizmodo articles and why would you stay home for the for the raids? I mean, makes no sense to me. Yeah, the fact he removed some computers as well suggests that there was some information there he didn't want them to get. So I think you're right. I think it all came down to uh this this ato raid i think like you say the reporter had someone on the inside they told him what was happening and tipped him off right freaked out and fled as we know however right flatly denies this which can be heard in this particularly feisty clip from 2019. so when you have access to the uh code base and could update the github and when you had access to your account on bitcoin talk and when you had access to your satoshi and gmx.com email when did you decide that you would stop using those and stop having influence over the project? And then side channel appear as a broke guy later with no successful business interests, no Bitcoin tied to his address, no uh, running from the government in Australia from the Australian tax office. I'm uh, sorry, I'm not actually running from Australia. I'm in Britain. You know those extradition laws in Britain to Australia? Sorry, morons who make things up that's called libel and slander. That's why I've already got a number of people in court, yeah. because they're dumb. They have no idea that you can't uh, basically be a public figure in Britain and run from the government. Right. You're only a public figure because you cosplay as a tertiary. So there we go, Arthur. We're just morons that make stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> Nay, everybody who was saying that he was fleeing and uh, where instead he is himself uh, saying, no, I was already in, in October uh, going to uh, London. Yeah, maybe. But at the moment of the raids and the moment of the Wired and Gizmodo articles, he was in Australia. Well, either way, he hid in the toilet from them and then ran down the service stairs. So he's pretty keen to get away. <laughs> well, that brings to a conclusion this incredible i mean it's not even 24 hours in the life of, of craig wright it's more like 12 hours really um but it brings to a conclusion that incredible spell that does so much to propel us forward for the rest of the story in the next episode we will be looking at the fallout from these failed doxing attempts and we'll be looking in much more detail at Wright as he tries once again to prove his candidacy as Bitcoin's creator through these cryptographic signing sessions that turn out to be about as successful as a picnic in the middle of the southern ocean. Arthur it's been a pleasure as always thank you so much for your time and your insight and your knowledge. Thank you uh, Mark it was a pleasure indeed. Um, links to Arthur's library of writings on Craig Wright, including deep dives into the evidence discussed here, as well as much, much more, are available from his Medium page, My Legacy Kit. And you can follow him on Twitter, also at My Legacy Kit, for all Wright-related news and insights. Arthur, thanks once again, and I'll see you for episode three. Yep, see you next time, Mark. Thank you for listening to episode two of Dr. Bitcoin, The Man Who Wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. If you've liked what you've heard so far, we'd love it if you could rate and even review us on your podcast app of choice and help us spread the word. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast too in order to get the episodes the moment they drop. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so via email at drbitcoinpod at gmail.com. That's drbitcoinpod. And please follow us on Twitter at drbitcoinpod. That's at drbitcoinpod. You've been listening to Dr. Bitcoin. The Man Who Wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. Written by Mark Hunter, with additional material by Arthur Van Pelt. Editing and production by Mark Hunter. This has been a Contented Media Production.